driving to church this morning, I'm never really sure when I open. <laughs> so I always kind of have a backup plan. <laughs> and as I was praying and driving this morning, I was listening to um, the song that we sing um, that I just forgot. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> wow, I just went blank. It's number two on the CD from the Bethel Women's Worship. <laughs> Tammy sings a new song. It is well. Thank you, Jody. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it is well. Even when I can't remember it, <laughs> it is well. Well, that wasn't part of the plan. Okay. Did I get the song? I wrote down what God spoke to me. <laughs> Note to self. Write down the song. It is well. And I just, I love that song. It's, I almost listen to it almost every time I'm coming here. I have like my favorites that I just fast forward through on my CD player. And, and one thing just jumped out at me just loud and clear. And, you know, as, as we're ending 2015 and we're looking forward to 2016, I thought, well, isn't that just appropriate? Let it go. Let it go. And I have been feeling very strong that we're entering a season of manifestation. In order to receive what God has for us, we have to let go yeah. of the things that hinder us, the things that worry us, the things that burden us, the things that hold us down. Yes. And Wednesday, I, I, I don't even remember what it was. We were praying, I think, at the beginning of the service, and not even about anything. It just came to me that the weight had been lifted. And I was just so thankful, like just a feeling of thankfulness, overwhelming thankfulness. It brought me to tears. And I was like, what's going on? But the heaviness, whatever burdens that you have been carrying are gone. Yeah. And in that instant, I realized, like, you don't know how heavy those things are until they're gone. And you feel light and free. Right. And it was a sense of freedom and weightless, I mean, just peace, the worry, the, the, the anxiety, the, the, the feeling in your stomach that something bad's going to happen or something is going to get worse or it's just never going to get better. All of that heaviness was just lifted. And I thought, wow, I didn't even know I was carrying that. I didn't even know that that was on me. But when it was gone, it just impacted me so deeply. And um, I thought of Paul when he was talking in Philippians about the one thing, one thing that his purpose was in Philippians chapter 3, um, starting in verse 12. Not that I have now attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but I press on to lay hold of and to grasp and make my own that for which Christ Jesus the Messiah has laid hold of me and made me his own. I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet, but one thing I do, it is my one aspiration, forgetting that which lies behind me and straining forward to what lies ahead. That is what God wants us to know today. If you know one thing, let it go. Let it go. It's gone. It's so easy to, it, I should say so easy. It's not always easy to forgive, but it's almost impossible to forget. And we carry that memory of those hurts and those disappointments and those frustrations and the people that wronged us, those hurts, those, those things that are really hard to forget. We, we can put on our Christian face sometimes and, and boy, you know, we fake it till we make it. Yep, you're, I forgive you, I forgive you, but we carry those hurts. Yeah. We carry those burdens deep in our hearts yeah. and it starts to bitter our waters. And God says, let it go. Paul said above all else, one thing that he strived to attain, one focus was to let it go. And I remember a long time ago, we were doing our women's Bible studies, and God told me that our worries are like those hot potatoes. You ever play the game hot potato? You want to get it out of your hands as fast as possible. Our worries, our doubts are like hot potatoes. Get rid of them. Throw them away. Get them out of our life because they, 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 do, they, they, they steal our faith. They steal our belief. And they steal our joy. You know, and I am... I'm, I'm hanging on to my joy. I'm hanging on to my joy. I'm hanging on to my freedom. And I am just letting it go and forgetting. You know, and the people that we live with day after day, our husbands, our wives, our children, I mean, the people that, you know, we know the best, right? We know everything about them. And we're supposed to love them unconditionally. And um, there's a, a song that uh, uh, 
sons and daughters of the living God. Well, if you listen to that whole thing, at the very end, he sang a song, Jason Upton sang a song that he wrote when he first became a father. And it's called, It Ain't Easy. Yeah. <laughs> and he was talking a little bit about what he was going through when he wrote that song. And he said, you know, if we really loved like we're supposed to love, it's foolish. And it's going to hurt because we're going to be rejected. We're going to be taken advantage of. We're going to be disappointed in people who don't understand what we understand, who don't have the revelation and the foundation that we have. He goes, and you feel like a fool for giving a fool. I'm a fool for forgiving a fool because they don't even know. They're just taking advantage of me. They're walking all over me. People tell you you're stupid, you're ridiculous. But you know what? That's what Jesus told us to do. That's his example. He said, you want to steal from me? Here, take my coat too. You, you, you know, you want to, I mean, everything I have is yours. Yeah. It's not easy to love like he loved. Right. And Nathan, you read it Wednesday night out of Matthew, uh, <coughs> Matthew 22, where they were trying to trick Jesus. And they said, tempting him, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto them, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Well, I got to tell you, that's a lot easier than the next one. Because our God doesn't disappoint. Our God doesn't take advantage of us. Our God never fails us. His love is and his grace and his mercy are new every single day. And he is more than enough. He is easy to pledge my love to. I'm the one, I'm the one that turns. I'm the one that disappoints him. I'm the one that is, is fallible, right? But he goes on. Oh, if you could have just stopped right there. <laughs> it would have been so much easier. But he keeps going. And the second is like unto it. Just like it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Well, we can argue about who's your neighbor, but I think God would tell us anybody who's right next to us at any moment in time, anybody who's connected to us in any way. Our neighbors are our fellow human beings on this planet, and it ain't easy to love them as Christ loved us. Just like we're supposed to give it all to God, we're supposed to give it all to anybody around us. It ain't easy, but it's so worth it. When we give, God pours in. When we pour it out, God pours more in. And any time in, 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 gosh, it's been a while now, in the years since I've known him, when I've struggled, I've always known that's when I need to find someone to pour into. When I'm focusing on my own situations, my own problems, I need to find someone to minister to. I need to find someone to give. I need to get my eyes off of myself, get my eyes on God, and be a blessing to somebody. Yeah. You know, we've taught, I mean, Sal, you've told stories about when you need, have a need for healing, go pray for someone that has that need. And get your eyes off of yourself. Stop. We don't have to pray for ourselves. Ours, we're taken care of. Yeah. Ours is finished. Yeah. All of our blessings are finished. We just need to go find someone else to bless. Yeah. And our blessings just flow. Yeah. Those blessings flow. Yeah. And we all have different gifts and abilities. And when we all are ministering to each other and to all those around us, that's beautiful. Yeah. And that is the picture of a fool loving a fool. Mm -hmm. That is the picture of the love of Christ. Yes. And so... The Lord wants us to just let it go. Be free. You know, I've told that story so many times about the Lord showing me, you know, that room, that locked room. And I knew my sin was in there, and I didn't want to go in there. I didn't want to show him. And I walked in. He walked in behind me, and I was remembering all of that junk. He walks in behind me, and he lights up the room. And it was empty. And I was shocked because I knew that my sin, were, well, they were many. And I looked at him, and he said, you're the only one that remembers. Why do you let these things have power over you? No one, we're the only ones that remember. And there may be others that want to remind us. I don't know. I, well, I, let it go. And, we, and by letting it go, we can free others to let it go. You know, when we, when we stop holding those offenses, we free others to let it go and get free and receive a love that is so special and so rare in this world. The love of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. So in the new year, let's let go and hang on. Because I'm telling you, the season of manifestation is upon us. And I am ready to receive all that God has. And there are, I mean, whoo, you guys hang on. It's getting good. 
All it takes is two of us here in this place, and it's good. So, praise the Lord. Anybody have any prayer requests or any praise reports this morning? standing here and understanding the manifestations of his presence. The Lord uh, spoke to my heart and said, you need to change the meaning of what COPD is, crisis overpowering disease. So just to stand in that. And uh, she explained to me last night that I'm not the best nurse. <laughs> so I need to have a little more mercy and um, get rid of my European heritage thought patterns. Uh, yeah, 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 you know where I'm coming from, so. Lord teach me the right way. So Amen. be with her and want her back here. Yeah. Amen. Well, I'm guessing that's why I was woke up all that night. <laughs> I was yeah. supposed to pray for Cindy. <laughs> you get woke up, the Lord wants yeah. you to increase the song. Yeah. Pray in tongues if you don't know what it is. That's what I normally do, so I must have been praying for Cindy. Yeah. Know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Anybody else this morning? Stand and go to the Lord this morning. promises you have given this body in this house, Lord, that your people are here, Lord, faithful to you, Lord, looking to you, Lord, to lift you up and magnify you, Lord, to, to worship you together, Lord, to lift you up.
it is finished. That it is finished. Thank you, Lord, that you humbled yourself and came in human form as an infant, humble in a manger. Lord, that you showed us the way, the way to love and light and peace and joy. That you have sent your spirit to live in our hearts, Lord. That all blessings are in your spirit, by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Continue to give us wisdom and revelation. Open your word as never before. As we hunger and we thirst for the deeper things of you, Lord, transform our minds. Transform our lives. Transform this place, this house, this house of prayer. From glory to glory. As we look to you, Lord. We look to you to lead us and guide us. Oh, Lord, we say yes to you. Oh, that you are welcome here, Lord. Have your way in this house. Have your way in each of our homes, Lord, in each of our lives. Oh, we thank you that you are faithful, Lord. We thank you that your word is perfection. Give it for us to speak. Your truth spoken the power to deliver, to save those who are lost, to set free the captives, to open the blind eyes, to open the deaf ears, to help the lame to walk and run and not be weary. Give your people boldness to speak your word you like never before, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, let us swing our swords as we loose our lips, Lord, to speak forth your truth, to see your kingdom come, Lord, through our words, Lord, through our love.
Hallelujah. I pray for those that are traveling this weekend <clears throat> and those that are battling uh, a little extra Christmas cheer. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Yes. <laughs> Not so cheerful today. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for Sister Sally stepping in and we always appreciate it. And, and just because your just because your daughter's up there doesn't mean you can't come up there too. I got enough for two more microphones up there, channel five and channel twelve. So those are still to be filled. <coughs> and two stools. Yeah, and the two stools. There's stools to be filled. Um, the thing the thing is, <coughs> there's some songs that I know we're supposed to be done here, but without enough voices, I I can't do them. I, I just can't do them. Uh, the vocal support has to be there. Otherwise, it'll sound uh, like somebody running with one shoe off, okay? <laughs> and I won't do that. As the Lord leads. Anyway. Every knee will bow. <laughs> Every tongue confess. Jesus Christ he is Lord forever. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ he is Lord forever. You think the wise men would do this at the stable if it was today? They'd be going around the stable, they'd be having a, uh, what do they call it, Jericho march? Jericho march around the major scene, yeah, okay. Praise the name Jesus. Oh. First Peter's out section. Can't 
just a moment there Set me free
us the tribulation ends. The sun will darken, the moon will give no light. The stars will fall and the power of heaven will be shaken in the sky. And then the sign of the sun.
Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord, as we gather, Lord. As we gather, Lord. As we gather, Lord. As we gather, Lord.
God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hope everybody had a great Christmas. Merry one. Amen. Praise God. It's the season, hallelujah, for everybody to acknowledge the Lord. That day's coming, you know, praise the Lord. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, praise God. We get the privilege of doing it now of our own volition, hallelujah, praise God. Thank you, Jesus, amen. Any kids here? Kids, if they haven't already left, they may. Praise God. Well, thank the Lord. We've uh, we've had two Christmases so far. We've only got one to go. Praise the Lord. No, we've actually had three Christmases. You and me, one of the kids, all of the kids, and more of the kids. Praise the Lord. So our house has just been one crazy place. Praise the Lord. But it's it's great. Hallelujah. So thank the Lord. Amen for all of His blessings and. Uh, especially for him. Praise God. So I want to talk to you uh, this morning. I'm just going to, we're going to have a little, kind of a Bible study thing here. And uh, Sheila, you're going to just have to go like, you know, your hair is on fire. Praise the Lord. But it is kind of red, but praise God. It used to be. Yeah. I can see it red from here. I only wear these so I can see. Praise God. But anyway, I want to start with uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll read verses 18 and 19 to begin with. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. And I mentioned something here Wednesday night, and, uh, and Suzanne and I talked about it just a little bit after the service, and, uh, and the more I thought about it, and the, the more I realized God had more to say about it than, than I had, praise the Lord, it's not unusual. Uh, sometimes I have more to say than he does, but his makes sense and mine doesn't necessarily. So. But I want to I want to start off with this. First Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Uh, verse 23 now, Sheila, same chapter. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now, this is what I mentioned Wednesday night, and I didn't go into a lot of detail about it because it really wasn't the focus of what I was uh, teaching on, but it, it was relevant nevertheless. But anything, the point that the scripture is trying to get across to us is that anything outside of Christ, anything outside of his grace is subject to corruption. Anything. Any of you been in church any length of time, you can bear witness to this. I told a little story, I may have, you may have all heard it before, but I'll say it again only because it's my story and I can do that. But uh, a number of years ago, uh, when I resigned the church that we had started in uh, Altoona, and, or in Ankeny, excuse me, and, uh, and dropped my license with the organization that I had been or, ordained in and everything, uh, I went to work, I was working, in fact, I was already working for Eagle Iron Works uh, while I was pastoring because this, the church was small and there was very little income there. But uh, beside that, uh, one day I was getting off work and I was coming up the driveway or the aisle way between two of the buildings there. And a guy from a church that I had preached at many times uh, here in Des Moines, a part of that same organization, came up to me and said, you know, the Lord has spoken to me. And I said, really? And he said, yes. And he told me that if you don't come back to the organization, he's going to kill you. He's going to take your life. I started. And I didn't know really quite how to <laughs> take it. So I just thanked him and went on my way to the parking lot and got my car and left. Well, uh, may, uh, maybe a month or so later, I don't know exactly how long it was. I, used, I had a motorcycle, I had a Harley, and I used to, I'd ride it to work sometimes, and I just rode. And Sally rode with me a few times, and then she decided that the better part of valor was to stay away from that motorcycle. <laughs> but anyway, I was coming home from, 
I might have been work, I don't know, but I was coming home from Des Moines, and we, were li we lived in Ankeny at the time. And the uh, car, I was coming up to a T road, and a car, as I pulled out, it didn't really sideswipe me, but it run me off the road. And they had, they were, it was a new road that they were building there, and there was no shoulder on it, so there was like a two-foot drop-off from the edge of the road. So when I swerved to miss the uh, car, I made the fatal mistake of looking down, and if you ever read motorcycles, you know that wherever you look is where you go. And I looked down, and that's where I went, end over end, down the highway. And uh, I was unconscious. I woke up in the hospital with a separated shoulder and my ear kind of dangling a little bit, praise the Lord, and some bruised ribs and other stuff. But anyway, I, I, I thought at the time, I was in the hospital for a couple of days, I come home, and I thought at the time, I'll bet at that church they are shouting the victory. Talk about a, you know, a Jericho march because they, they thought their <laughs> prophecy had come to pass, you know, that God got him. We told him to come back to us and he didn't do it. My point is this. It wasn't God. Amen? Amen. That was a corrupted word yes. from a human being who claimed that it was God. And I, I think he probably believed it was God. But it wasn't God. It was corrupt speech. Amen? Now look at this in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, and you can see the context for what this really means, what it's talking about. It's not talking about swearing. It's not talking about using, you know, just bad language. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Let's look at this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer. Now how many of you know... He wasn't ministering grace when he told me God was going to kill me. It was corrupt <laughs> communication. It was not something that is in alignment with the word of God. It wasn't something that agrees with the personality or the character of God. But it was something from a human heart that was angry, that was upset, that was, you know, whatever. And it was corrupt communication. It was saying God said this when God didn't say it. It was corrupted, right? right. Now that's my premise for what I want to talk to you about today. Let's go now to Matthew chapter 8 and verse 4. And I got a, like I said, Sheila, I got a lot of scriptures here. It's the only way I can really get the point made here. But Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Now that was a leper that Jesus healed. This is what's interesting, and the point I'm trying to draw out here is that he said, don't say anything to anybody. He just healed a leper, but then he tells the guy that he healed, keep your mouth shut about this. All right, don't say it, don't talk about it. All right, all right, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Amen. All right, that's when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? They all kind of said their own little deal. Elijah, John the Baptist raised from the dead, and so on and so forth. And then Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Man hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Then he says, Don't tell anybody this. This came from God, but don't say nothing about it. Don't tell anybody else about this, right? Okay, Mark chapter 7 and verse 36. And he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, so much the more, a great deal, they published it. So the more he told them to keep sh quiet about it, to shut up, the more they talked about it, right? right. All right, now that was uh, when he healed the deaf and dumb guy, the, the, the guy that was deaf and had the speech impediment, or obviously if he was deaf, he couldn't speak right. So Jesus had just healed this guy, and then he says, don't say anything about this. Keep your mouth shut, right? All right, then Luke chapter 8. And verse 56, Luke 8, 56. This is after the little girl was dead. Remember, he was called, and he says, she's not dead, she's just asleep. Mm -hmm. And they laughed him to scorn, the scripture says. They mocked him and everything. And he goes in, raises the little girl from the dead, and says, give her something to eat, she's hungry. Uh -huh. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Okay, so why all the secrecy is the question here. Why would the same Jesus 
who sent his disciples to preach the gospel to every creature, issues so many warnings to people to keep quiet about his miracle working power and about who he actually was. Right? There's an important clue, and it comes, it comes to us in Mark chapter 9 and verse 9. Mark 9, verse 9. This is at the Mount of Transfiguration. They'd seen this Christ glorified. They'd seen his robe, his, his uh, visage as white, as bright light. Amen? They heard the voice, the audible voice of God saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. You know? And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. That's the clue. Amen? Don't say anything until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Why? Because you don't know Jesus until you grasp the basics of his cross, resurrection, because that's when grace comes in its fullness. That's when a new dispensation starts that we understand to be grace, the dispensation of grace. So he's telling everybody, don't say anything about this until we get to the place where it can really make sense, where it can really be revealed to people. Amen? So a partial revelation of Jesus does more damage than good. That's why Jesus keeps saying, keep your mouth shut about this until it's in a context that can make sense. Because a partial understanding of Jesus will do more damage than it will do good. And how many of you have been to a church where you got a partial revelation of Jesus and it'll mess you up? Yes. And it'll mess everybody up that you try to share it with? Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Nothing mars the teachings of grace like a distorted picture of Jesus. That's why Jesus came in the first place because they had such a distorted uh, image of God that he had to come and be a revelation of that and, and reveal to them the, the true nature of God, a God that loves, a God that so loved the world that he gave. Amen? You know, Vince Lombardi, when I was a kid growing up, he was the icon of college football or uh, uh, professional football. And uh, he was the legendary coach of the, of the Green Bay Packers. And my younger brother and I, Dan, who has since passed away but has gone to be with the Lord, we used to fight all the time. We've got pictures of us in the backyard in football helmets. And he was about 6'3 and weighed over 300 pounds. He played football for you and I. I was about 6 foot and weighed about 175 when I played football in high school. And uh, so it really was not a great matchup, except that I was older and smarter than him. <laughs> so I was able to whip him in different ways. Some call it cheating. I call it wisdom. I, I just, <laughs> but nevertheless, he was a big Bears fan, a Chicago Bears fan. I loved the Bears too, but not when they were playing Green Bay. So anyway, what was amazing about it was Vince Lombardi would always start every preseason training camp with these words not only to the seasoned veterans that had been playing in uh, pro ball for years, but the ball players that were coming out of college that had played football, but only on lower levels, you know. And so he would start his preseason camp the same way every year, and he'd say, gentlemen, this is a football. Now, it sounds idiotic because these guys have been playing football ever since they were kids, you know. But the thing he would always say is, this is a football. And by drilling the basics over and over and over again, he transformed a team of perpetual losers for years into legendary winners. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Football legends. All you got to do is go through the, the Football Hall of Fame or, or the, uh, any, any uh, reference to, uh, to, to professional football and you'll see those early teams that were nothing and nobody couldn't beat themselves out of the locker room started winning and became, uh, you know, a, uh, the icons, really, of professional football for years. Well, I guess the question then we have to ask ourselves is, what is the Christian's football? Grace. It's grace, and that's why we continue to teach grace and grace. You think, oh, I've been in church all my life. Yep. But your lives are not showing all that you have available. All that is possible. Right? So let's look at this in John chapter 19 and verse 30.
John 19 and 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So he finished his work and dismissed his spirit. This is the fountainhead of grace. Yes. Amen. This is the cross. This is what the cross is about. Praise the Lord. This is what God did for you. Praise God. Amen. There's nothing, amen, that you can say about Jesus that makes sense apart from this. You take this out of the equation and all of a sudden Jesus is some scatterbrained weirdo flake. That doesn't make sense. So you try to teach Jesus without any real reality, real truth, and you get a distorted picture of Jesus and everything from that point on becomes more and more distorted. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. The law came by Moses, grace and truth by Jesus. Praise the Lord. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Praise God. Christ died for our sins. That's history. Or excuse me, Christ died. That's history. Christ died for our sins. That's theology. Praise the Lord. Now, let me... Give you some theology, praise the Lord. And, and, and from the Bible, not from our denominational point of view, but, but from the Bible itself. Remember, we're, we're still dealing with corrupt communication. These guys had information, but it became corrupt. Amen. And Jesus' concern was that they would corrupt the, the truth because they had limited understanding. They weren't experiencing the totality of God's grace and God's goodness. They were caught between... The law and grace. Right. The law was still in effect. As Jesus has given them revelation of grace, and that's why he keeps telling them, don't talk about this, because it's going to get perverted. It's going to get twisted. It's going to be misunderstood, because people are coming from two different backgrounds, two different mindsets. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So let's begin. I got like, I'm just going to give you five. There's plenty more than this, but for the sake of time, I'm just giving you five. Number one is redemption. Redemption. That redemption is the shed blood of Jesus purchased, amen, you for God. Yes. The shed blood of Jesus purchased you for God. Yes. Amen. And by that ransom, Christ set you free. Yes. Hallelujah. And this spiritual freedom makes possible emotional freedom, yes. which then allows us ongoing deliverance. That's why someone said here this morning, we don't need to pray for ourselves. Suzanne was talking about it. Why? Because we've got ongoing deliverance if we understand the true gospel. Right. Without the gospel, we're always running around trying to find the next Benny Hinn to pray for us. Right. You don't need Benny Hinn. You've got Jesus. You've got the healer living in you. You need to understand it. The reason we pray for people, we pray for people that don't understand that. Right. Come on. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. So redemption is what Jesus, is the shed blood of Jesus purchasing our redemption, purchasing us for God. Amen? That's the ransom that sets us free. All right? Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you observe, overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. What I'm saying is remember this stuff because the next time you need to talk to somebody... About Jesus? Yeah. Say, here's a football. I mean, give them the truth. Give it the basics and get them back to where they need to be so they can really understand how this Christianity is done. Right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. We're still talking about redemption here. The shed blood of Jesus purchasing us for God. Neither by the blood of goats and calves. This is Old Covenant. But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Everybody understand that word, eternal? Eternal redemption for us. It's eternal. Once you're redeemed, you can't be unredeemed. Like you can't be taken away from you because you didn't pay for it. You weren't the one asking for the payment. You were the, the one who needed the payment. 
And Jesus was the payment, and God received it. Hallelujah. Eternal redemption. Praise the Lord. Galatians chapter 4, 4 and 5. Because the devil wants you to believe this is temporary. Tell your next screw up. Till the next time you forget this is a football. Praise the Lord. He wants to have you totally under his control. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. Who's that? Everybody outside of Jesus is under the law. They were then, they still are today. You have one of two ways to be judged. Either in Christ or outside of Christ. Outside of Christ, they're going to use the law. In Christ, they use the law too, but he already fulfilled the law. So you're redeemed, amen? To redeem them that were under the law that we might, we might receive the adoption of sons. Hallelujah. We're not just, we're not just, you know, buddies or, or, or acquaintances with God. We are sons of God. Hallelujah. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So you, some people talk about, you know, sanctification is a process. No, it's not a process. The, maybe the manifestation outwardly might be a process, but sanctification is not a process. It all happens in Jesus. He was made unto us wisdom. We have the mind of Christ. If we'll operate in agreement with his word, we can operate with the wisdom of God. Amen. And righteousness. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Why? Because he gave me his righteousness when he took my unrighteousness. Praise God. And sanctification. I'm sanctified. I was sanctified the moment I got born again. The moment I believed in God, I was sanctified. I was holy. I was righteous. I was pure. I was set apart for God. Hallelujah. He set me apart. And redemption. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay, that's one. Now, here, let's get another one. Covenant. Covenant. By the cross, the covenant is by the cross. And God signed it in blood, in his own blood. Yes. Every covenant under the Old Testament had to be a blood covenant if it was going to be a lasting covenant. Right. Somebody, if they don't keep the covenant, has to die. Yeah. Praise the Lord. He made the covenant on our behalf. We couldn't keep it. Somebody had to die. So he dies. Sheds his blood so that the covenant is enforced. Amen? It's the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace. That's the New Testament. The old covenant was the law. The new covenant is grace. Not a mixture. Not some of that, some of this. It's a change. It's a stop there and start here. Grace. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. Remember the scripture that says, uh, be ready always to give an answer to anyone of the hope that is in you with meekness. Amen. What's it, what are they talking about? Be ready. When, when, you, when, it's, when somebody opens the door, when, when the Holy Spirit goes before you and opens the door for you to witness, be ready to tell them about the hope that's in you, this reality, this truth, not some mumbo-jumbo religious denominational doctrine, but what God says, what God has done. Give them the truth. Right. Amen? Make them more than conquerors. Right. Make them a hero. Praise the Lord. Amen. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, a better covenant. That's a, the, the, those words are interchangeable. Testament, covenant, they're the same thing. That's why we have the Old Testament, New Testament. They're just simply the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Amen. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant. Yeah. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, let's look at this. Uh, Hebrews 8, verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a, everybody say better, better, better covenant. We don't, why would anybody want to go back to the law? But the Bible itself tells us it's not as good as what we got. This is a better covenant. It's a better covenant for us. Praise the Lord. 
a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Why? Because the promises are all one way. They're not based on me doing something in order to get the promise. The promise is a set in stone thing from God. I promise if you're a believer, this will happen. These signs will follow you. This is what you can expect. Healing, deliverance, prosperity, ongoing, amen, revelation of God. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. See, the, the, we, we, we start out with the game plan, like trying to diagram on the chalkboard, the, you know, the, you know the, the right guard pulls this way, the, 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 the right tackle, he comes back around and catches the, the end off the corner. And I mean, we got all these, you know, this confusion and everything else. And what we really need to know is this is a football. Before we start trying to get all this confused issues going on. Just, just let's settle this as a football and go from there. Let's get the basics and operate from that reality. Praise the Lord. Now the God of peace that brought again the dead of our, that bought, brought again the, from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Everlasting covenant. Yes. This covenant is an everlasting covenant. The other one was temporary. It had its limit. This is an everlasting covenant. Praise the Lord. Make you perfect in every good work, to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight. See, he, he has good things He wants us to do. He's the one that does it. Yes. It's Him working in us that makes it happen. Praise yes. the Lord. And working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, that's covenant, right? Now let's go on. Number three, propitiation. Propitiation. Big word, praise the Lord. Let me give you Webster's uh, uh, definition of this. Propitiation is to cause to become favorably inclined. What does that sound like? Yeah. Sounds like grace, doesn't it? Yeah. To cause to be favorably inclined. Yeah. Or to win or regain the goodwill of someone. There you go. Praise yeah. the Lord. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. See, this is covenant. Now let's go. Uh, God, by nature, cannot be satisfied with sinners. He just can't. Because they are polar opposites. By dying, Christ fixed that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nothing heals the scars from religion or legalism like propitiation. It brings back the favor of God. Yes. Yep. Praise the Lord. It, it wins. It regains the goodwill of Almighty God. Praise the Lord. God is satisfied with you. Yep. He isn't disappointed. You may be, your spouse may be, your kids may be, your parents may be, the neighbor might be, but God is. God is totally satisfied. Jesus satisfied him. I don't have to wake up every day wondering, did I do it all right today? Did I did it, get it all right? Will I get it all right? Did I do this? Did I do that? Now, when you're dealing with people, this is what Suzanne's talking about. It's a struggle. But listen, I can promise you this. What she said is absolutely true. It is well between you and God. You may, you may still have to believe for some right. it's well between you and somebody else. Right. But as far as God's concerned, right. it is well. It is yes. good. He is satisfied. He is totally satisfied with you. Amen. He's not disappointed. Right. Amen. What you get from God is just an endless smile. A just as you are satisfaction. Yes. He looks and he says, I'm satisfied with that. That's good. Praise the Lord. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. I taught a lot of Bible studies over the years, especially when we first uh, were working in the church in Texas. God, I don't know how many we did. We did them in our home. We did it in other people's homes. We'd have groups. We'd have individual couples. And <sighs> Wouldn't to God I could go back to each one of them now and give them a real Bible study. 
<laughs> not an indoctrination to a denomination. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I, w I wish I could go back and just say, this is a football. Yeah. Come on now. Let's, let's start here for the Lord. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Remember the definition? He is what causes us to become favorably inclined to God, from God. Amen? Propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's available for everybody. Yes. For God so loved, right? Yep. All right, uh, chapter 4, verse 10 of 1 John. So I'm just saying, if you need scripture about the basics, these are them. Yep. This is what we, we go all the way, we know we use all kinds of stuff to fit our denominational viewpoint. Our little schisms and isms and all that kind of stuff. And we miss the fundamentals, which is why we end up failing. Come on. Praise God. And unable to overcome the enemy. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Yes. God is the one who wanted to be favorable towards us but could not because of sin. And so he sets this deal up so that he can be the propitiation or the means by which we receive his favor. Yes. That is grace. That is the gospel. Yes, Lord. That's what this world needs. That's what we need. It's what the church needs. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. I'm telling you, Christmas would be a lot merrier if everybody in the world could know this. Yes. Oh, yeah. Praise the Lord. You wouldn't have to worry about your UPS packages being ripped off the front porch. <laughs> Amen. Because some clowns out cruising looking for where they can get. I can even see where the police even now tell you, don't even put your empty boxes out because there are people cruising around looking. Oh, we've got some nice stuff in that house. Because look at the boxes that are empty out here. Right. Exactly. Praise the Lord. That's pathetic. But it's, it's the reality of where we are. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Hallelujah. His righteousness created propitiation. His righteousness brings God's favor to me. It brought his wrath on him because he had to bear my sin. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 17. Hebrews 2, 17. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be more made like unto his brethren. That's us. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Praise the Lord. That's the next one I want to go to. Reconciliation, number four. God found you as an enemy. Praise the Lord. But he makes you his friend. God, it's weird how, you know, God never asks us to do anything that he hasn't already done. So when he says, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, Again, like Suzanne was talking about, because he first loved us. That's the number one. We are to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then to love our neighbors as ourselves. Same kind of love, right? That's exactly what God did for us. Exactly what he did for us. He makes us his friend. We were his enemy. Just by nature. By the fact we were human beings. We were enemies of God. He made us his friends. He finds us alienated and reconciles us. Praise the Lord. Reconciliation is God's way of making peace with sinners that don't necessarily even want peace, <coughs> who may not even know they're in war. But God uses reconciliation in order to make peace with sinners. Praise the Lord. Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. <coughs> and 
and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Thank the Lord. Praise God. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. Thank you, Jesus. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Amen? So that we can do the same thing, right? To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. How can you reconcile somebody if you're not sure of your own reconciliation? Come on. I mean, how are you going to bring... Peace to somebody if you're in turmoil. Right. If you're in fear and anxious about everything with God, how are you going to bring any kind of uh, sense of, of peace and acceptance to somebody else? Come on. Right. Amen? Repeating the trespass unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. Amen. Accept it. Receive it. Enjoy it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Share it. Yes. All right, number five, justification. Now, justification is what actually, it's like a sentry. It's, it's the thing that actually stands guard over the grace of the gospel yeah. so that it can't be perverted, so that it can't be distorted if it's taught. Because God justifies the ungodly. Praise the Lord. God justifies the ungodly. Now, what, by, by what kind of logic can God do that? I mean, naturally speaking, it makes absolutely no sense. It's not logical. It's counterintuitive. The only way it can happen, the only logic of substitution, the only way it can be is by the logic of substitution. His righteousness becomes my righteousness. Just as my sin became his sin. That is the only way, logically, you can make any sense out of justification. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 3, verse 26. We have been justified. Praise God. Found innocent. There's, there's no double indemnity. You can't be tried for the same crime twice. Somebody already was tried and paid the penalty. You get to go free. That's justification. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believe or believeth in Jesus. Praise God. Whoa, that... Man, I'm telling you, makes me want to giddy up. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hmm. Whatever that means, hallelujah. Come up with your own adjective. Uh, Romans 8, 33 and 34. Man, I want to be happy. I want to stay happy. I want the joy of the Lord. You know, happy is what comes and goes with happenstance. That's where that word comes from, happenstance. So happenstance is stuff that's happening, right? So happiness is based on stuff that's happening. Either good stuff's happening and you're happy or bad stuff's happening. Listen, you can have the joy of the Lord and you can be happy. You can stay happy because your conditions in the truth, in the reality of all of this is always good. No matter what it looks like, it's still always good. You're good with God. I mean, come on. If God is for you, who can be against you? Praise the Lord. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. That is a rhetorical question. 
It's not like, give me a list of eight, things, eight people or eight entities that might, you know, be able to. No, nothing. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Nobody. Nothing can. Right? It is God that justifieth. He has declared you innocent. He has justified you before the courts of heaven and everywhere else in between, including the lying devil. Who is he that condemneth? Well, we know it is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen. So people think God is condemning them. That is idiotic. It tells us right here. Who, who is it that's condemning? Well, how can it be? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Yes. You're never going to get a condem condemning word from God. You're never going to get an accusatory word from God. If it comes, it's coming from your screwed up conscience or the devil planting crap in your head. Yes. Praise the Lord. Pardon the, yes. the English there. I was telling Toby a moment ago. It's like, you know, the guys were talking about Iowa. They say, oh, you know, uh, how do you get, uh, how do you change a light bulb in Des Moines? It takes two people, one to turn the light bulb and another one to go find some place that has electricity. Right. I mean, that's the way the world perceives us. And the other one was, uh, what do you call a person from Iowa that steps in a cow pie? Or no, what do you call it when a person from Iowa steps in a cow pie? A shoe shine. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So there are a lot of weird, distorted images out there. But you know, that's what I'm saying. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's law? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It's not God. If you're hearing con condemning words, it's, just write it down. It's not coming from God. He has already justified you. This is coming from a, a conscience that is not renewed to the Word of God, or it's coming from the enemy trying to twist the Word of God, like he always does, like he has since the garden. Did God really say it? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> All right, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Praise the Lord. We're about done. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What part of that stuff does Christianity not get? Praise God. This is a football. I mean, really, it's insane. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is the cross. This is the Savior. This is salvation. This is a gift. This is grace. This is the gospel. The truth that a lost and a dying world desperately needs. And I might add, much of the church. Yes. The more deeply we know a truth, the easier it is to explain it to others. Right. Praise the Lord. The easier it is to apply it to our own lives. Amen. That's why it's, this is a football. Yes. Last scripture, Hebrews 13, verse 9. You ever remember the scriptures where the Lord is my strength, my shield, my buckler, my strong tower? Yes. It's a mighty fortress. Yes. That is grace, church. That's grace. Be yes. not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. That ought to be a life scripture. Right. Amen. Don't be, don't be tricked and, and deceived by all the deep and mysterious teachings. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Right. Praise the Lord. Grace will build a fortress that the enemy cannot penetrate. Right. This is grace. Mm -hmm. Apply it to your heart. 
quiet your mind and then open your mouth and share it with somebody else. Praise the Lord. Give them the value of Christ. Give them the revelation of Jesus. Give them grace. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, it is the gift that keeps on giving. It really is. It, it, it's not just for Christmas Day. It's something that we live in and lives through us every moment of every day that we're on this planet. And in fact, it will live on throughout eternity, forever bringing glory to God. Hallelujah. And giving joy to us. Amen. He's a great God. He's a good God. And he's on our side. Hallelujah. Anybody tells you different is either a liar or a fool or both. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The gospel is not complicated. We just need to keep going back to the basics, back to the basics, and back to the basics. And one day, the scripture even says, we will be in that hall of fame, the hall of faith that just simply believed what God said. And if you go to Hebrews 11, you can see a little capsule of that. And what you'll find is absolutely nothing negative about any of these people. That when you read their stories in the Old Covenant, you say, ooh, these are dysfunctional people. These are bad. These are not good. But when you read it in grace, through the eyes of God, all you see is how faithful these people were. God called them faithful. And they are faithful because he said they are. And it's true of us. Amen. You're in the book, but it's not your sins that are in there. Amen. It's your faith. Praise the Lord. Your faith in him applies all of the faith of Jesus Christ into your life, into your history, into your record. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Give him one more hand clap. Praise God. Thank you. Amen, amen. God bless you. Just be happy. Hallelujah. This is a football, man. Let's, this is a good time. Every time, today there's like four games. I can tell you what they are, but I'm not going to bore you with that. But they are. When you're watching it, just think. This is a football. Amen. And the ones that play the game the best understand how to play the game the best. The ones that are most successful in Christianity are the ones who understand Christianity. They can be the most influential when it comes to touching other people's lives. Just give them the truth. Give them grace. Yeah. Hallelujah. And God will do the rest. Praise the Lord because you've done it all. Amen. God bless all of you. Hope you had a great Christmas. Happy New Year to all of you. If I don't see you before then, and uh, just keep living for Jesus and enjoying all the benefits he's provided. Amen? Yeah. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you. Don't worry. Be happy. Praise the Lord. And you don't need the ganja man for that. No, you don't. <laughs> 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 Thank you, sir. May I have another? Praise the Lord.